Tuesday, uh, November or December eighth, um, at uh, it's one o'clock. We're at the Ottawa Airport at the Canada uh, Aviation and Space Museum. Um, my name is Sarah Weidenhammer. I'm uh, interviewing uh, Herb Saravanamutu. Um, so uh, maybe we could just start uh, with your name and age. Yeah. Well, my name is Herb Saravanamutu. I'm uh, 82 years old. I was born in Scotland and I've lived in Canada since 1955. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, where were you born? Uh, I was born in Prestwick, uh, just beside the airport. So I was involved with aviation from a very early age. And what did your parents do? Uh, my father was a civil engineer, my mother was a teacher of modern languages. Both university and Glasgow graduates. Uh, as a child, uh, what did you do to pass the time? I had a large collection of airplane toys and models, and I was always in some airplanes. Now, uh, related to uh, to your interest in, in airplanes, did you have a, an early interest in, in science and engineering? Well, I suppose so. I, uh, my father uh, was a civil engineer, both his brothers were doctors. Uh, he hoped that my, my brother and myself, one of us who made us the one to do engineering, uh, we both finished up doing engineering. Were you particularly interested in aero engines when you were younger? Well, fun enough, I was one in aeroplanes, and I was, uh, actually I grew up in Scotland because of the war. I had not been to the war, uh, I'd have grown up in Sri Lanka. Uh, but uh, um, I was very interested in aeroplanes, and the University of Glasgow uh, opened the Department of Aeronautical Engineering uh, the year I was starting university. And I, in fact, he entered the aeronautical program, uh, but my father uh, felt that aeronautical engineering was too specialised and uh, there maybe wouldn't that many jobs in that area. Uh, so very reluctantly, I, I switched to uh, mechanical engineering, and uh, I wasn't really all that interested. And so actually, fun enough that uh, I'm one of the few people that had a defining moment where literally a light went on. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the old movie Breaking the Sound Barrier. You've heard of it, yeah. Because I went to that one night and for the first time I actually had a jet engine start up on the, on the movie. Uh, and, uh, and that, in fact, I went home that night and thought, gee, you know, let's get into this. And uh, I've been in it for 60 odd years. Is this a movie where they discovered that they reverse the controls? Of That's the right. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so what classes did you enjoy or, uh, or dislike when you were Actually, I enjoyed all, all the classes. The, nothing I, uh, I disliked. One of the classes I enjoyed most uh, was electrical engineering. And, uh, but I did also uh, enjoy very much thermodynamics. And that's essentially mostly what I've specialized in, in later life. So how, how did you get in, uh, into, uh, into the aviation industry? Well, um, the first job I had, as a, as a, or second job I had as a student, uh, I worked for uh, British Thompson Houston, a summer job, uh, and that was testing uh, components of uh, gas turbines. And that was a, I found that very, very interesting. And uh, when I graduated, I wanted to get into the, uh, the engine industry. Did you describe your first day on the job? Do you remember anything specifically from it? <laughs> not, not really. You mean my first professional job when I went? Well, the funny thing was, the first professional thing that happened was that uh, I was actually hired into the University of Glasgow uh, by Avro Canada. And I was under the impression I was to be hired to work on engines. But it turned out that there was Aviro Canada, was the parent company, and there was Avro Aircraft and Arenda Engines. So the first thing that happened when I got here was that I found that I was in the wrong place. and. Uh, so I said, I don't want to work in airplanes, I want to work in engines. So I actually, there was, I, I sat up in the uh, guardhouse, I think, for the better part of a week, uh, while they sorted out bits of paperwork, and I transferred from Avro Aircraft to Arenda Engines. In fact, Avro Aircraft went to the grave with a $3.22 outstanding, which was my vacation pay for the week I was there. 
So going back to uh, to when you worked for a British Thompson Houston, yes. um, you described some uh, dangerous work that you're at, you're asked to do. Uh, they're working on the Armstrong Sibley Python turboprop. Well, it wasn't supposed to be dangerous work. The basic what we were doing was testing uh, the turbo starters. Uh, the turbo starter for this engine, uh, which was quite common at that time when, on military engines, uh, used contact charges uh, uh, to uh, blast a sort of steam of high pressure hot gas uh, through a small turbine running at very high speed geared uh, uh, to the shed. And what we were doing was uh, a so called tight case uh, where we had to do 150 starts with no maintenance. So, in the case of uh, uh, we were driving a big flywheel that simulated the engine, and you had to sort of put this cartridge on the, uh, on the starter. Uh, go through the firing procedure, run it up to full speed, use a hydraulic brake to bring it down, wait for things to cool down, take it off, and do it again. And uh, uh, But when you actually, you've seen the countdown on the typical rocket, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, we have ignition, and then everything starts to happen. Well, we, when we use these contact starter charges, when you went through the firing, the firing procedure, one of three things happened. You got a normal start, which happened nearly all the time, or you got a, a rogue charge, which had a safety disc in it, the pressure was too high, it uh, blew out. Uh, but the last one uh, was, was what happened was you pressed the firing switch, nothing happened. And, and then the charge was live, and the procedure was uh, that you waited for 30 minutes, opened the door, and took the charge off. And of course, that's why they employed people like me uh, and one day we had one of these false starts and we waited 30 minutes and said okay Herb in you go and as, as I opened the door it went off. Another five seconds later it would kill me. Presumably uh, today's engineers would be horrified with this sort of uh, procedure. Well I think we're a bit more concerned about the safety these days than we used to be in those days. So can you tell us about the process uh, through which you decided to come to Canada to work uh, at AV Row? Well, basically that uh, at the end of the war, uh, that, that, that was 55, that was 10 years after the war, uh, things were still pretty, not very good in, 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 in Britain, and that uh, Canada seemed to offer a lot of opportunities, and there were a lot of young people uh, emigrating to Canada. And, uh, uh, so I, that was in my class at university, there was a Canadian student and his father was in fact a, uh, in charge of the immigration office in Scotland and uh, through him uh, I, I came, came to Canada. So uh, you said you were initially hired, were you hired to work on the Aranda engine? No, no I was just hired as a junior engineer by, I see. Uh, well, it was, it was in fact a aircraft company. Mm, but you <laughs> insisted on working at a random yes, around Yes, okay. yes. And that was because uh, by that point you were particularly interested in, in aerospace. Yes, yes. Um, can you describe your early work uh, at Arenda as a stress engineer and the sort of materials you worked with? Yes, the, the interesting thing was that the, the stress group uh, was quite a large group, maybe 15 of us, and about nine of them Nine of ten of these guys uh, were all from Bristol engines, uh, which later became Bristol Sydney, later became Bristol uh, Rolls Royce. Uh, but there was a, a, a large uh, uh, influx of British people into the, that group. And but I didn't really want to be a space engineer, but I got a job and they, and they put me into a space engineer. Uh, and what we were doing then was, a, of course, that the, uh, there was very little computing uh, available. Uh, in fact, they had just finished uh, doing disk stressing by hand, and uh, uh, they had a very rudimentary thing called the card punch calculator, uh, which speeded things up a little bit. But firstly, uh, all of us were working with cycles, and uh, that the, um, the we later, uh, that was 55, uh, about 56 at a render, uh, we got an IBM 650 computer. Now to put that in perspective, uh, at that stage the biggest computer in Canada was the IBM 704 at Avro that was being used for the aerodynamic design of, of the Arrow. 
uh, that we got this IBM 650 at Orenda uh, in 1956. And I should point out that the University of Toronto uh, didn't have a computer then and got the IBM 650 uh, two years behind us. And McGill got one about four years uh, behind us. So it was uh, a pretty big hotshot computer for its day. Uh, and by the time this came along, I moved on to a different group uh, working on, on heat transfer and stuff like that. Uh, and he eventually migrated into the, uh, the computer lab and there was only uh, four of us in there uh, supervising three, three engineers, actually two mathematicians and me. I was the only engineer. Um, we did all the computing for, for the, whole, the, whole, the, whole, the whole company. And it's quite handy to recognize that uh, that machine uh, had a total storage uh, of 2,000 watts, 2K, on a rotating drum. Mm. Uh, uh, it was very noisy, very tiring to work in there. Uh, used cards, uh, cards for reading, uh, reading uh, punching and, and, uh, and it, it, the cost of this machine in 1956 uh, was twenty thousand dollars a month at a time when an engineer with about three years' experience made five hundred dollars a month. So in other words, this what now seems like a Mickey, totally Mickey Mouse computer cost a salary of forty engineers. Could you maybe describe uh, what the computer looked like in the process of using it? What made it so tiring? Very noisy, extremely noisy. It was the, it was maybe the no, the, the rotating drum uh, itself was quite noisy. Uh, but the main noise was the, uh, the, the, the noise of the card punch machine. It was actually very noisy and it was either reading or punching cards nearly all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, was, it was in fact in a large uh, air conditioned room uh, that the, the factory the, 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 where the computer was was where all the engineering staff were located um, and it was not air conditioned at all. Uh, and in fact, that uh, uh, when the temperature got above some magic number, which escapes me now, about 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, we were sent home because sweat would get on to hitting the drawing or anything they were working on. Hmm. But the, the computer had to be air conditioned. Now, there was uh, a very large uh, central processor which uh, uh, would be uh, the size of this table and about five feet high uh, and the card punch machine would be a bit bigger than a standard mo modern copying machine um, and in fact that we had a full-time technician assigned us from IBM uh, and it was a red letter day uh, we didn't have to have at least one valve change it was a literally uh, you might twice a day uh, have a stoppage uh, because some vacuum tube valve went and the technician had to come and repair it. So, what sort of calculations were you performing on the machine? Well, we're doing basic stress calculations and aerodynamics, and, uh, uh, engine performance, um, well, all the calculations that we do today, except they were much simpler. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have the, the computing speed or the memory or anything, but uh, it was a big, big advance on cycles. Was that computer technology comparable to what was being used in, in Britain and the United States? Oh yes, oh yes, yes, definitely. And as things went by, you got better computers, though, though that was quite adequate in those days uh, for the work we've done in engines. That uh, uh, I certainly, as a space engineer, I'd never heard of finite element methods, which I don't think even been started. I don't know when finite element methods uh, were first developed, but I'm sure it was in the early 60s or thereabouts. At that point, did you often travel as part of your job? Ha! Never. But uh, in my time uh, in the uh, I, I made one, one trip. Uh, but that was after the hour of crash that uh, when we were working in industrial turbines. Um, but no, no, no travel, whatever. But you've also got to remember that in those days, there was very little business travel anyway, because where now it's commonplace to hop in an aeroplane to come up from Montreal to Toronto or Toronto to Ottawa for the day and back, 
uh, this was not possible in the, the days of uh, slower aeroplanes and less aeroplanes in that. And that uh, um, so on that job, no, didn't travel at all. What sort of uh, social activities were you involved uh, with uh, at work and after work with your co-workers? Not really very much. We had the odd social stag party and whatnot, and playing the cricket team at the uh, arena and uh, uh, go to the movies with people and whatnot. It wasn't really very much. Were there any uh, obvious social problems in your peer group at that time? Absolutely or? none. The, 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 when I read that question, I thought, yeah, can't think of anything. There, yeah, now sadly, that one of the guys uh, did obviously drink a little bit too much. He was not much older than me. Uh, he was a very good, very able guy. And the last I had of this poor fellow, that he actually killed somebody driving drunk and died in prison. But generally, no, well, there was no infidelity. That, 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 well, come to think of it, there was in a large group like that, there were, <laughs> there were, there were a couple who actually swapped wives. That, uh, that, that was a that was the extent of it, but quite a large nothing. So could you describe the Aranda uh, Iroquois engine? Yes, the, the Aranda Iroquois was a very advanced engine uh, with a lot of innovative features. That uh, uh, it was one of the first engines to make massive use of titanium, which is why it was so light. Uh, it was also one of the first engines uh, to have no inlet guide vanes, which uh, was a considerable aerodynamic advantage. Uh, it was one of the first engines to have fully modulated after bumper. Uh, in those days, after bumpers were either on or off. I mean, some of them had uh, two positions. You could have minimum after bundling or maximum after bundling, but the, Uren the Iroquois was one of the first to have uh, fully variable after bundling. Does that mean you adjust the amount of fuel that's going into the system? Yes, you had to adjust the nozzle size as well, because the thing is, the, with the afterburner, uh, depending on how hot it is, that the, it depends on how big the nozzle opening has to be uh, to, to pass this flow. I see. What stage was the uh, Iroquois program at when you, when you joined? Um, well, I joined in September 55, and uh, the engine uh, was running. There were, there were a few, uh, maybe two or three engines had run, but not very much. It was at a fairly early stage of the, uh, the actual testbed development process. But there were complete engines running, there were bits breaking, and we were having to redesign bits. And, uh, um, so that was at the time I got there, it was just early in the running phase. How advanced was uh, the Canadian turbojet technology relative to uh, other programs in, say, Britain, France, US? Or the I'd say country? it was every bit as advanced. That uh, one of the things a lot of people don't realize uh, is that it takes a lot of power to, to test a compressor. And in the early days, testing compressors was very difficult because of the, the large amounts of power required. And at a render that we had, in fact, a test facility uh, up at Paris Sound, a place called Nobel. Uh, and up there, we had uh, the, the steam turbines from a World War II destroyer, uh, the Hunt class destroyers, uh, and the steam turbines were actually used to drive the, both the Oenda compressor and the Iroquois compressor. So there was some really quite advanced uh, testing uh, going on. And at the time of the cancellation, uh, the Oenda was in fact building a large altitude test facility. Uh, which was just abandoned uh, when the program was cut off. So I've read that Canadian facilities for engine testing and production were, were more modest than uh, other engine manufacturers, say in the United States. Did you, did you find that was the case? No, no, no I don't think so at all. And the the Arenda uh, was certainly totally the, the Arenda was totally competitive with the Rolls Royce Haven. Uh, the, the, a lot of people this may as be. Uh, propaganda, but reckoned that the Arenda powered saber was was the best of the F eighty sixes. There were sabers with the uh, jet electric engines, the Rolls Royce Avon, and, and the Arenda. And they, in fact, the Arenda built close to four thousand Arenda engines for the F eighty six and the CF one hundred. So it's a lot of engines. 
Was there a lot of sharing of knowledge between different engine development projects in different parts of the world? No, there wasn't. It was pretty competitive, but certainly some of the technology migrated to, uh, to Canada, uh, mostly because of individuals rather than because of uh, the, the, the combustion system on the Iroquois was a, a vaporizer system which was actually developed by Armstrong Sidley. Um, when I started in the business that in Britain there were about six engine companies, Rolls-Royce, Bristol, Armstrong Sidley, De Havilland, Napier and Blackburn. Uh, they eventually formed into two major groups, Rolls-Royce and Bristol Sidley, and then eventually Bristol Sidley was taken over Rolls-Royce to make some money, essentially national companies. But uh, uh, there was a, we got visits from the, the, the great white chief from uh, Paco Sidley, like once a year or whatnot to come inspect what we're going to colonies, so to speak. But uh, um, I don't think there was, I was, of course, a very low level uh, body. I, I, I don't think there was like, any real direct collaboration at the highest level on, uh, because certainly the, 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 and the Iroquois, I know, was, was very much lighter than the Olympus, which had been built at the same, the same time. Uh, and this was largely because of the, the, the use of uh, uh, titanium in such large amounts. Uh, and also the very novel bearing concepts that were used in the Iroquois. The Iroquois, as I recall, had only four main bearings. Uh, most other engines of that period had about seven main bearings. So this saved weight, but uh, uh, it was very innovative. Uh, design. So, uh, despite the uh, the Hawker Sidley parent company of AB Row and Bristol Sidley, these were essentially national programs that didn't share a lot of. I believe so. Yes, I'd say definitely so. That uh, uh, I think that uh, the, the the Hawker Sidley people would, would come out once a year to see that everything was doing all right, and that, that, but essentially we operated totally independently of them from the design point of view. We were using. British methods. Now, the guy who was the, the chief aerodynamicist, Harry Keast, uh, he was a, a Cambridge graduate, one of Whittle's original aerodynamicists, but in this fact that he came out of the Whittle operation didn't mean that we were uh, being fed information from them. It was actually what Whittle, eh, what Keast himself, brought to the company. So, um... When uh, AV Row initially hired their engineers, uh, they mostly hired from Britain, is that right, with British expertise? Well, there were quite a lot from Canada, but uh, there were also a fair number from Holland, Germany, uh, but mostly from Britain. Yeah. And mostly from, uh, mostly from Rolls-Royce and Bristol. Um, who did you know at uh, Davy Rowe and Aranda? Did you like? Did you know anyone in upper management? Did you meet anyone in upper management? Oh well, yes. That uh, in fact, that the uh, Bert David, for example, who was the, the, the chief engineer, uh, and he was only thirty-eight. You know, that's one of the things that impressed me as a young guy uh, coming to Canada. That uh, in most of the Russian companies, you got the impression you didn't get a sharp pencil until you were about seventy. Mm. Uh, but uh, the, the Aranda was really a pretty young company that, uh, that, that there, was, there, there, there was in fact uh, one of the very senior guys, Charlie Grenier, was the vice president of engineering. He'd come from Bristol and he'd been uh, uh, quite prominent at Bristol before he came to, uh, to Canada. I'm not really sure why there were so many guys from Bristol uh, in this desk office. I think it was a case that two or three went in the first place and then they told a friend it was a great place to work and they'd tell a couple would come and so on. And the, the, uh, so there was a very strong section there that were all ex Bristol. Was it a good place to work? Uh, that's a good question. It was a great place to work. It was really interesting or not, but I think it was badly managed. The, the, uh, the whole, the whole hawk, uh, uh, aviator operation, uh, particularly the, the, the cancellation was abominably handled. That was that was really totally bad. How so? What uh, what what decisions were made that weren't? Uh... Well, we were strung along. I remember going to a sort of um, a meeting where Bob Lindley, who was the chief engineer at Avro, gave us a pep talk in November about everything was fine, everything was going just super, 
uh, and that uh, with the whole engine department uh, from Arenda over there to visit the Aberdeen facilities. Uh, and about three months later, the whole thing was cut off. Well, that was a, the point was that was a, a government decision or a company decision. But the way the company handled it uh, was really very bad because they literally fired everybody over the PA system. Now, I was uh, at that stage, I uh, had been working on, we started working on industrial gas turbines. And for about six months before the, uh, the, the crash, uh, that the, I hadn't worked on the aero program and working on industrial programs, but I, I was in the computer lab. So we're all hoping, oh, maybe there'll be big layoffs, or maybe we'll be okay, maybe some groups will be okay, and so on. Uh, and I was in the computer lab where uh, the PA system didn't come in. It was the only part, bit of the factory that was air conditioned. Uh, and uh, I was in the computer lab and the PA system didn't come in there because it was sealed in air conditioning. Uh, and somebody opened the door and said, quick, there's a message on the PA system. I ran into the hall and said, what is the message that you're fired? <laughs> and I actually missed um, the message, uh, which uh, the message was basically that the, uh, following the cancellation of the RO, uh, there was no more work on all hourly, weekly, and monthly paid staff for given notice of immediate termination of employment. So you had no idea that was coming? No. no. Well, we certainly that we knew there were going to be cutbacks if the, if the program went, but nobody expected uh, the whole thing to shut down uh, yes. just, just like that. Was management taken by surprise? or? I think so. I, I, I don't know. I was far, far too low down to be concerned with it. Mm. Uh, I was just a worker bee. The... But the thing that was interesting uh, that a lot of people, there's a lot of false ideas about, was that the, the Americans were the bad guys, and it was quite the opposite. The, the Canadians, uh, by and large, were really quite miserable to the people that lost their job. So there's a lot of sort of, sort of shadow throws the work that covers it now. But uh, the, the, there were guys in there, I was lucky, I was 25, 26, and uh, I was in an area where I found a job very easily. But there were guys in their 40s and early 50s who were out in the street trying to sell vacuum cleaners, full of brushes and stuff like that, couldn't find work. But it was the American companies that came in and recognized the amount of talent that was available here. Uh, and a good friend of mine, a very brilliant guy, um, he, wanted, he, was a, he wanted to come to work for NRC in Ottawa. Uh, they could not find the means by which to move this man from Toronto to Ottawa. Uh, one of the American companies, RCA, uh, came in and said, move all your stuff, send us the bill, I will see you there. And that happened all over the place. People went to Cincinnati, to Phoenix, to West Palm Beach, to Florida, uh, all over the state, uh, and they were all, bring all your stuff and send us the bill. Whereas in Canada, it was a case of, well, hard luck, you're out of work now. Mm. Worse than that, that when I went and said, okay, now what do you get uh, in the way of unemployment insurance? Oh, you haven't paid for three months, don't get anything. In those days, when you reached the magic number of $5,000 a year, uh, you stopped paying into income tax, into unemployment insurance. And I had paid into unemployment insurance for about three and a half years or so. And then for the last three months or so, I, I hadn't paid and uh, not a penny, so you were one week salary, that was it. And as a result of that, the Association of Professional Engineers of Ontario fought a test case over the name of a man called Gus Lazarevich, uh, who was a man in his 50s, Polish, uh, who was a professional engineer uh, of weekly paid, weekly paid staff, as was nearly everybody. And the company fired him, gave him a week's notice. And the APEO, uh, for a test case in this and they said this man should get six months salary as reasonable notice of, of dismissal uh, and after quite a, a bit of legal hassling uh, the, the courts awarded three months instead of six months and the company appealed against this and lost and that really set uh, that was the first industrial settlement uh, in Canada where some sort of thought was given to what was reasonable separation in the event of a major 
shut down Windows. Mm -hmm. uh, now I know it's moved on from that now, but there are formulas based on how long you've worked for a company uh, and so on. But in those days it was eight by the week, five by the week. So there were some positive effects to shutting down the Europe program? <laughs> well, <laughs> you could say that yes, that was a positive effect, and say uh, there were a lot more negative effects than positive effects. Yeah. So, uh, while at Miranda, how involved are you with the metallurgical aspects of engine design? Well, very little. As a space engineer, that uh, obviously that we, we had to know what the material uh, properties were, but uh, there was a metallurgy group that uh, uh, essentially selected the materials, and we had uh, very rudimentary materials manual, nothing like the kind of databases available mm. today, but you know the, the, we had our own information on the various materials, but most of this was in fact uh, obtained from the manufacturer, the material manufacturers, uh, and uh, that we did in fact, uh, through the metallurgy group, do quite a lot of creep testing uh, on various components, what have you. Uh, um, basically, we, we just bought in the, the materials that were available on, on the market. Creep testing as well, was that when the materials are subject to heat, their expansion? Well, it takes a a very long period, uh, high temperature and high stress. I see. So when you test that uh, at but the turbine blades that are operating at very high stresses and very high temperatures, uh, they gradually stretch and they eventually will rub uh, and eventually they will in fact come apart or rupture. Uh, I'm not a metallist at all, so please forgive my uh, uh, if I get some terms wrong, uh, but uh, the point was that the uh, that creep testing was very important to be able to understand how long you could run a turbine blade at a, at, at a high temperature. And uh, but we were we were essentially a really slaves of what was available from the major made people like. Like Inco and Allegheny, London, and I forget who else, but the other ones. Inco is based in, in Britain, is that right? The... No, Inco, well, no, Inco was, I think, they were all based in Canada. Oh, really? Yeah. They were doing the LA in Canada? I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't, I, I, I'm, no, I'm, I, I think that was even in the United States. Mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, I'm, you pretty sure, pretty sure that was done in the United States. It's, it's hard to keep. Uh, certainly, that you, you think of Inco and Sunday yeah, Monday, yeah. but uh, they're, they're mainly a supplier of nickel. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I mean, nickel went into the alloys, which were a high percentage of, of nickel. But I think most of that uh, development was done within the United States. Mm -hmm. but, um, <clears throat> so, uh, you described in an email the challenge of uh, using uh, cooled turbine blades and how that was actually solved uh, using. Uh, any material? Can you talk about that? Yes. Process? Well, what we were trying to do uh, in 1955, uh, the Iroquois had a design turbine temperature of 1300 Kelvin. Uh, and that was about 150 degrees hotter than anything had run it before. That, uh, and what we were looking at was a cool turbine uh, that would give 150 degrees, 160 degrees centigrade um, of cooling. But they were very crude blades, uh, and essentially they, they were the ones we were looking at initially were sort of essentially the blade, uh, the main body of the blade had sort of cavities machined out of it, and then a cover plate welded over them, and then you would bleed the air in through the base of the blade and up through these. These were enormously crude uh, and really would have been quite ineffective. But apart from that, they didn't hold together. They, they, we couldn't get them to hold together. Now the problem with these blades was that they didn't get the cooling air anywhere near the leading edge of the trailing edge. Uh, and we got these, you'd have got these enormous thermal stresses caused by this. But the point was that nobody could actually make these blades. And NASA, or NACA as it then was, came up with all these wonderful uh, pr proposals for cooled blades with huge amounts of cooling and whatnot. Um, but the fact was, it wasn't a heat transfer problem, it was a manufacturing problem. Mm -hmm. And nobody can manufacture cool blades. What eventually solved, they saved us was that the uh, INCO came up with a material called INCO 713C, which became very widely used. And it was found 
Now, instead of uh, trying to do cool blades with 1300 Kelvin temperature and the associated parasitic losses of uh, uh, the, the cooling, that with Inco 713C, we could go to 1275 Kelvin and get the same performance. Now, at that stage, everybody, all the engine manufacturers in the world, gave up on cool blades, with one exception. And the one exception was Rolls Royce. And Rolls Royce persevered with that. Uh, and they got the first uh, cooled blades running a bit before 1955, but they, Rolls Royce actually very proud of the fact that they had a million hours in flight with cooled blades before Pratt and Whitney got a cooled blade into, into service. But the point was that Rolls Royce were the people who kept going mm -hmm. uh, when everybody else said it can't be done. And of course now, cooled blades uh, are commonplace and they. Uh, uh, they're using industrial engines and they're using out temperatures 1850, 1900 Kelvin, civil engines, probably 2000 Kelvin and higher, and modern military engines. Uh, and of course, at these sort of temperatures, that if the cooling fails, you can lose a blade instantaneously. Mm -hmm. okay. How did they solve the problem? Who? Uh, Rolls Royce from the. the well, by gradually developing more sophisticated manufacturing methods, starting very simple. Uh, gradually more complicated and uh, gradually finding ways of drilling much smaller holes with lasers and what have you, uh, electrochemical machining and, and a lot of new uh, technologies involved in being able to produce a blade uh, that was full of holes but was still strong. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and these are quite standard now, but it was a very, very major manufacturing problem to overcome. Could you describe the challenge of, uh, of developing titanium compressor blades? Well, it was not so much of com titanium compressor blades, but it was titanium compressor blades and a titanium casing. Uh, and uh, what was found was that if the titanium blades rubbed against titanium casing, you got a very intense fire. Uh, and in fact, at one stage, we, we had a, a, a titanium fire uh, on, on the test bed uh, where there was a heavy rub and the engine uh, went on fire uh, and the heat generated immediately triggered the automatic fire extinguishers which happened to be carbon dioxide fire extinguishers uh, the heat was so intense that the carbon dioxide dissociated into carbon monoxide and oxygen and caused an even better fire <laughs> which was quite uh, interesting. But uh, what eventually happened was that uh, there was no solution to that. The solution to that <coughs> was to have uh, a separate material uh, like a steel, a steel ring uh, inside the, the casing so that if the titanium blade rubbed, it would rub on steel and not on titanium. Now, there's other uh, materials used for that. Uh, no, some are de designed to erode uh, if the blade, the blade rubbed. But even quite recently, uh, General Electric uh, had trouble with titanium fires uh, on LM2500 engines uh, about 25, 30 years ago. So, uh, Were you using a, a magnesium engine casing at that point? Or not? There was magnesium casing used at the front ends, uh, uh, on both on the Arenda. Uh, I believe on the Arenda, the, the, the whole casing, uh, compressed casing was magnesium. On the Iroquois, uh, the front the LP compressor casing was magnesium and the HP was, was titanium. Magnesium was widely used in early aero engines uh, and has pretty well disappeared from engines today. And that was, uh, a lot of that was caused by corrosion problems, uh, particularly on marine applications of gas turbines or gas turbines that flew anywhere near the water. You mentioned the expense of, uh, of cast turbine compressor blades. Um, no, it was, it was, I think I mentioned the, the, co the cost of the, the cooled turbine blades. All right, yeah. And I definitely recall those were $1,000, which was then thought to be very high. Now you say that's $9,000. No, yeah. I thought it would be more than that, because $9,000 now would be a typical price of a, of a cooled blade. I see. You may, you, it may be... Um, a bit higher than that, now, depending on the complexity. The blades are very much more complex mm -hmm. uh, now, but uh, 
the numbers I was quoted by one major engine company for a typical high pressure turbine blade on a modern civil engine was the cost of a high end high end motor bike. Yeah. Which might be twelve, fifteen thousand dollars. Yeah. But it depends on the size of the blade and the complexity mm -hmm. um, of, of the blade. But certainly it was then very expensive. It wasn't so much that it was the expense of the problem, but it was the fact that the scrap rate was so high that you couldn't really sort of really survive with the making all these blades and scrapping a huge number of them and then not having uh, any life from them anyway. And these blades are still manufactured in Canada, is that right? You've got me there. I don't know. I don't know where they were manufactured. They certainly weren't manufactured in the house. They were mm -hmm. manufactured by some uh, specialty manufacturer, and I don't know who that was. So, so what were the biggest technical challenges in, in building uh, the Iroquois engine? Well, keeping the weight down was very, was very important. The, the, in those days, there was two philosophies of engine design. One was to build an engine that was a bit in the heavy side and gradually make it lighter. Uh, the other was to sort of make it as light as possible and then when it broke, make it a little bit stronger. Now, of course, we try to get it right the first time. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, the, the main problem was durability, getting the engine to, to hold together for a long time. There were lots of uh, what they call placarded speeds where you couldn't operate. Uh, at a certain speed for very long because of, say, vibration on the seventh stage compressor blade or the third stage turbine blade. There, there was a list of these placarded speeds that you, so you we were certainly at the stage where some of the blades had to be strengthened or the frequencies changed so that they were, were out, of the, out, out of the running range. But these were all, as far as I could tell, just as a young guy, were part of the development project or any advanced, uh, any advanced engine. So you're suggesting that the Iroquois was one of these engines that was designed to be extremely light and then and, and then strengthened. Um, I think so. Yes, I, uh, it was certainly designed to be extremely light. That was uh, that was the probably the Iroquois' biggest selling point was was its low, low, low weight. What problems still remain to be solved when that when the program was cancelled? I think it really just mainly durability and the. Uh, uh, I don't think there were any really outstanding problems that were obviously wrong that you, know, you had to start off again in the day. Um, I don't know how many hours we actually had running in on, on the engine. There were about probably 12 engines had run. I'm not sure uh, how, how many. Uh, and um, there had only been a very small amount of flying. The, the, the flying test bed that was used was appalling. Uh, job of, of mounting an Iroquois on the back of a B-47. You may have seen the pictures. Yes. It was, uh, it was, uh, the, the B-47 was a very difficult airplane to fly normally. Never mind with this once it's made weight stuck in the tail. Uh, and there was in fact a, an uncontained turbine failure in flight on the, uh, on the B-47. And I don't know uh, enough about that what the cause was. But anyway, it was a a fairly major setback, but uh, I think that again was a case where uh, it was perhaps a reckless management decision to push ahead uh, with, with this flight program uh, before they got this quite right. So, and, it, and it was a uh, it was, it was uh, a turbine blade failure, I believe. Yes. So if it'd been a disc failure, it would have taken the airplane apart. So, I'm sure it was a, a blade. Do you know what was behind the decision to acquire a, a B-47 or just what was available? Or? It was the great difficulty of finding a test bed for a big engine like that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, this, by the, by the standards of the day, uh, was a very big engine. And uh, you go down the stairs, you're going to look at it. Uh, but the, the diameter of the uh, four feet, uh, whereas the diameter of the, uh, the, the other end of two and a half feet, maybe. It was uh, heavier, bigger, longer. Um, to this day, well, uh, to now, in fact, uh, there was a period when, if you go back about 25 years, I suppose now, uh, where people say, you don't need flying test planes with computers and all this kind of stuff. You can simulate all this and you can do uh, flying test planes at a waste of time. We were now at this event last week, uh, last night, actually, Aviation Week, but currently on the 
certification program for the, the A320 Neo family, the 737 MAX and the COMAC in uh, China, uh, CFM, are a flight, and their flight test program, I've got 84 engines in that. And that's both about flight, flight and test bed running. Uh, and they're, they're, but now, all of these big engines can be tested on something like a 747 or an 1840. Uh, sorry, they're even going to be testing an 1880. And that, uh, uh, so that when you get up to an eight, the, 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 the Olympus 593 on, on the Concorde, uh, they had to fly that under the Vulcan bomber, and that was a very complicated uh, installation. But now, with the, uh, the, the, the engines for the 737 and the AC20, uh, they're being tested for uh, GE. I've got two 747 test beds, and they've got an engine on that, and practically I've got at least two 747 test beds um, as well. But uh, the roles are flight testing uh, the big engines for, for the A350 and whatnot uh, with an A380 you know, in terms of a uh, 10 foot diameter fan. And it's pretty hard to, to fit this on the, even the 747. I understand that when they were making the Iroquois, they, they included uh, accessories, which I assume means tooling and that sort of thing, uh, in uh, Imperial as well as metrics. They were considering selling it to, a, to an American company or letting them license produce it? No, no, no. There was a, everything was a Imperial, no metrics. All oh, right. Well, see. whatever, that and guarantee. But they were, in fact, a, uh, a good friend of mine, Dick McLaughlin, that became first president of March to Pratt. Uh, they were seriously negotiating with the French uh, to put the Iroquois in the in the large nuclear bomb. Right. Uh, and the, 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 what eventually became the Valkyrie, the, the, the Mark III uh, bomber. The initial, uh, in the competition for that, the, the Boeing proposal for that uh, was going to use six Iroquois engines. Hmm. So the point was the Iroquois could have lived without the Arrow. Right. That the, the Iroquois uh, was seriously considered by both the Americans and the French for, for top line uh, aircraft. Um, but eventually the companies would support it and it, the opportunity went away. It required a lot of Hawker Sidley somewhere to put up money to keep the development of the Iroquois going mm -hmm. without government, without Canadian government support. And they just didn't do that. I would imagine there were a number of indigenous programs that would have been lobbying against the, the adoption of a foreign engine. Um, I'm not sure about that. That uh, I think if you've got a very good engine that's better than anybody else's, that uh, uh, that uh, that that can over overcome that. And uh, but trying to give any examples um, of that, some of the Swedish uh, used. Um, American engines in the, uh, or British engines mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the air capital they were trying to develop uh, their, their, their own engines. Um, the French, the, 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 uh, the Briggy Atlantic, the, the twin engined uh, anti submarine aircraft that the French are still operating to this day as your Rolls Royce engines. Uh, the Cancel, uh, which was built in Germany, uh, twin engine transport, uh, was also got Rolls Royce tiny engines. So there have been a number of cases where uh, companies, with their own, companies with their own capability have chosen foreign engines. Now you, you remained with uh, Arenda after the uh, after the cancellation. That was because you were working on industrial engines at that point? No, 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 no. I didn't remain with Arenda. I got fired. Oh, I wanted to go else. Uh, and I went and got uh, uh, a job in a computer consulting company because I was one of the few people who was uh, in computers in these days. So I went for, to work for a guy called Joe Cates, uh, who had a company called KCS. Uh, Joe Cates invented the Cain Chancellor at the University of, of, of Waterloo, a very, very distinguished uh, man in the field. And I worked for them for about six months, and uh, uh, it was a very Good company, but I really, my heart wasn't in that. Uh, and uh, eventually, my old boss uh, phoned me up out of the blue and said, 
Can you come back and work in the nuclear group, the result of the nuclear group? And I said, yes, I'll come and do that. Uh, and I suppose I was a reasonably bright young guy that uh, he, uh, he thought fairly well of. So I actually was the first young guy to come back to do a ranger. I was much younger than anybody else there. Um, then they started to build up uh, from, from there. But I worked on the nuclear uh, group for uh, a couple of years, I suppose. But uh, we were working as subcontractors to Atomic Energy of Canada. Uh, and this was very frustrating because you write your technical report and you'd send it off to Atomic Energy of Canada and they'd get to come back, it's all covered over in red ink, and you'd rewrite it, come back, call. And when it finished up, it was just the same as it was when it started. But there were all these uh, bureaucrats and people that wanted to cover their backsides and that they uh, the, the, and they only had to be done two or three times. And anyway, the, the, uh, while the nuclear engineering thing was very challenging, uh, when we started up with industrial gas turbines, I was extremely glad to get back uh, into gas turbines. Could you describe <coughs> excuse me, some of the work that you were doing uh, for the candy reactors? Yes, that, uh, uh, what I was doing, uh, we were working on the development of what's called a, a warm pressure tube which was a pressure tube uh, that was insulated uh, from the, uh, the, 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 hot, the hot coolant. Um, and so it was in multiple layers. There was a, there was a uh, zirconium outer layer, a layer of insulation, the main pressure tube, then another layer, and so on. Uh, and we spent a lot of time at our end uh, developing uh, this. And funny enough that the, Recently at Carlton University, we hired a guy, a senior guy from Atomic Energy Canada, uh, and we're looking at this thing again now, <laughs> after 50 years. Uh, but uh, also at Orenda, Orenda again, it seems a company that did have very significant manufacturing uh, capability and experience uh, and very good design capability. Uh, and uh, certainly one of the conceptual designs of the online fueling machine for Candu was done as Arenda. So the, the Arenda nuclear group was actually quite prominent for about well, 10 years or so, uh, and then it gradually wasted away. I'd gone with it. And you're doing computer work for them? Is that right? Uh, yeah, most, mostly. And that analysis, AG analysis, mm -hmm. computer. Uh, and computer work. But it also interesting was that the uh, Orenda, again because of their knowledge of high temperature materials, uh, normally creep tests uh, may be done for a thousand hours. You know, you load up something for uh, with a very high temperature, maybe say 800 degrees centigrade, and you put the load on it, and you can't do this for a thousand hours. Now a thousand hours is a month, a bit more than a month. What Orendi did for uh, Jock River was they did a 10,000 hour peak test on zirconium alloys. Uh, and 10,000 hours is over a year. Uh, a friend of mine well, was in, in, in charge of this. And of course, they did all sorts of alarms and what have you. And you get wound up in the middle of the night. So as they built the alarms going off, and you're ready to have to come running in at 3 o'clock in the morning to see what the problem was. But the point was, this was test that went on. For 10,000 hours. Now, I don't know how many people have ever done a 10,000 10, hour creep test. You normally have a 1,000 hour creep test that you can extrapolate, so lots of known formulas and things like that. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that Orenda was doing as essentially an operation with a very high standard of manufacturing skills, machining, design, uh, uh, and what have you. Can you describe some of the insights that you acquired about, uh, about uh, zirconium alloy? Well, uh, well the one thing, the, the thing that happened mainly was that it turned out these creep tests were not all that useful uh, because what John Trevor found was that once you irradiated the alloy, uh, it had a big effect on, on the creep life. So that the, I think the life that eventually got irradiated was much less than expected. Uh, from the creep test. I'd say I'm not a metallurgist, I'm just. Yeah. Uh, 
Could you describe your work on uh, on Miranda's industrial gas turbines? Yes, that the what we, we happened was that in a way it was lucky for Miranda that the uh, Iroquois got cancelled and it did. The Iroquois was not really suitable for an industrial engine, uh, but the Miranda actually was, and they that they uh, developed two sets of engine. Uh, based on the Orenda that, that was from the, from the Save and Save 100. One was to sort of just basically take all the engines back from the Air Force, refurbish them, put a power turbine on them, and package them and send them out. But the other was to maintain the aerodynamics of the aero engine uh, and build it into a heavy frame machine that would have a longer, a longer life. And it did it simply, did a, a, a major marketing study of this and they went to the look at the market and said which is better to have a heavy frame engine based on the aerodynamics of the uh, the aircraft engine or basically the aircraft engine slightly modified uh, and the market three to one said you want the heavy frame with the aerodynamics of the engine and what happened it was like the other way there were three engines made in the aerodynamics sold as the as, as the heavy frame now, we also then, using the Orenda, the scaled down version of the Orenda called the OT5, uh, which was a one and a half megawatt uh, unit. And in fact, that was the first successful cogeneration plant uh, in, in Canada. And this is the thing that disappointed me. I spent a long time trying to get sort of information on this, uh, both from DND and Orenda, and there was nobody about that could really say uh, anything about this. The thing was that they built this engine called the OT5, what something called the pine tree line, which was the pine tree was the, the, the dew line up at the very top, the, the pine tree line. Uh, it was part of the so-called distant early warning system. It was the closest in part. And the, the OT5s were designed to uh, provide all the electrical power and heating and air conditioning for remote radar sites uh, all through the year. So the, the hot exhaust was used to generate steam uh, in, 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 the, in the winter for heating uh, and for the absorption type refrigerator used for uh, hot exhaust uh, in the refrigeration process uh, in, the, in the summer. Uh, and these, there was about 15 or 20 of these up in the Pine line in the early 60s uh, and they ran for many years very, very successfully. Uh, they were the first engines designed to switch over automatically from uh, natural gas to oil and full load. The point was that they were able to get a much cheaper price on gas, natural gas, if they accepted it on an interruptible basis. Uh, but if you took an interruptible basis, you had to have enough oil on site that you could run for a day uh, on, on the oil. Uh, and these were designed to be able to switch over at full load from natural gas to oil uh, without a break. And that was done in about 61, 62 within a break. The next thing that we got into uh, was a competitive program for the US Army Navy uh, for 600 horsepower gas turbine. Uh, which eventually became a Navy engine. Um, and that was aimed at getting very high performance in a small engine. Uh, and it's interesting because that the, the specification that was set for that engine uh, in 1961, uh, 50 years later, there is nothing that meets that yet. And we got very close to it. I left just before that program was cancelled. I went off to the University of Bristol. But uh, that was a uh, interesting because uh, uh, two of the companies that we beat out in that were Ford and solar turbines uh, in uh, San Diego. Uh, and so we actually had a better product uh, than solar. Solar now are the dominant people in this smaller industrial turbine market and I've got about 15,000 engines in the field. I've actually run courses at solar uh, for quite a number of years and I know exactly what they're doing. And I find it very fitting to look at how successful they've been and to realize that we could have been, or Enda could have been that. <clears throat> the set of the capability was there. Uh, and then when the US Navy, well, what happened was that 
the US Navy decided they didn't want this engine anymore. The US Army decided they wanted an engine twice the power. Uh, we bid on that and lost, uh, and eventually Lycoming got that job. And that was eventually became the engine used in the M1 Abrams tank and it sold 11,000 of those. Mm -hmm. So, but anyway, that was after that, it kind of all dried up. I'd, le I'd left uh, about six, eight months before that, when everything was going really well, and I left just uh, with this desire to go back to teach at university. So that was a big market for, uh, for industrial gas turbines, the US defense system? No, it was the, that was where this engine had been developed, the big market with pipelines. Oh, I see. Pipelines, and that we actually put a lot of engines on Trans-Canada pipelines. Okay. But it turned out that they were Rolls-Royce come out with the Avon, which was again an industrialized aircraft engine. Uh, they swept that market away. Mm. But they're in the sold. They must have sold about maybe 120. Of, the, of, of these engines, I'm not sure, they were all over the world, but they, uh, but they essentially, I don't know if there's any stolen money now, they, they're all gone now. So. Did you main, maintain contact with your colleagues at Arenda when you moved to the University of Bristol? Yes, I did, but, uh, uh, because, um, well, I suppose, well, just, in a way, social Europe, Sometimes I wanted information from my book and whatnot, but I certainly kept in touch with them. And I, in fact, I kept in touch with my first boss there until he died, and I'm still in contact with the, the guy that divorced for me. He's now 90, and I corresponded with him regularly. Um, can you tell us about your uh, your work on the, uh, the Concorde engine, the Olympus uh, 593? Yes. Well, what happened was that uh, I started work on the Arrow. Uh, and in those days, I should have mentioned that we actually, as well as having this digital computer, I forgot about that, but we had an analog computer in the same, in the same, in the same lab. Uh, uh, and I did quite a lot of work on the analog computer, a totally different sort of thing from the true parallel machine that worked in, uh, in, in real time. And at uh, Render, we started to develop a model uh, of, the, of the Iroquois, uh, that in those days, that the digital computers were nowhere near fast enough to do the numerical integration for acceleration, dynamics, what have you. So we were working on this on the on the RO, and I did quite a bit of work um, on on that before it was cancelled. And then when we did this OT4 engine for the U.S. Navy, I developed the methods on on that, uh, and actually came up with a very successful. Uh, simulation of the of the engine for the U.S. Navy. Uh, we were certainly the first people to have done that. And when I went to Bristol, to the University of Bristol, um, I eventually went out to, to talk to, to Bristol engine people. And all these big engine companies generally sort of have a sort of not invented year syndrome, you know. And that the, but eventually it so happened I met the right guy. It's all the case of meeting the right person. And the university, the air department, had a symposium when they had some people come in from Rolls Royce, and they had a, the head of the electronics group who was talking about simulation and controls and what they were trying to do. And I got to talk to them and said, Well, how do you simulate the end? And he said, Oh, these bloody useless thermodynamics, they can't do it. And I said, Well, I came out and offered to do that last year. He didn't see me. So he immediately uh, gave me some money to get some stuff, and I and started doing it there. And so then I sort of uh, developed this model um, of, 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 of the Concorde engine and it was quite interesting because uh, it really seemed to be uh, unique what I was doing. Um, and the National Gas Turbine Establishment, which was a farm, uh, got hold of what I was doing and had to go there and started running engines for me. Uh, and uh, all the engine companies got a hold of my thesis and started using it. Um, and then with the British Aircraft Corporation, uh, the Guided Weapons Group, and they uh, found out what I was doing and they hired me as a consultant. And based on the model that I developed for the uh, for the Olympus 593, with the direct flight from what we started on the on, on the other car, uh, they in fact designed an all new uh, electronic control system for the, air in, for the intake control system on Concorde uh, and that's what the aircraft was, was certified with. 
So eventually, the, the, this is things not really known, that this uh, eventually immigrated from the Arrow to the, 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 the Concord. Mm -hmm. Did you work on the uh, Bristol City Pegasus by any chance? No, I didn't. The, the, I, the, the, I, I worked on the Viper and the, uh, the Viper and the uh, 593 and then later the RB211 that started up on the Spain, but I was actually never involved uh, with, with the Pegasus. I'm quite familiar with the Pegasus, but never actually worked on it. How similar or different was the work culture at uh, Bristol City to what we'd experienced uh, at Arenda? I don't think much different, really. That the uh, quite quite similar, really. That the uh, um, yeah, quite quite similar. Very, very, very similar. Under what circumstances did you did you return to Canada to teach at uh, Carleton? <laughs> oh, it's very funny that I was totally bogged down in Bristol. Nobody ever left Bristol. Bristol was a a very fine university. B one of the nicest cities in, in in England. And C nobody ever left. And, that, uh, uh, and I had uh, been there for, for six years, and that uh, I had actually was able to go. Well, the reason I went to Bristol in the first place uh, was that uh, I decided I'd like to go back to university, and I thought I wanted to go back to university to teach. I was much more in teaching and research. Uh, but what I found was that you've got no interest whatever from Canadian universities to into a PhD. Uh, but the British universities at that stage were it was quite common uh, to, to hire people with uh, a good first degree uh, and industrial experience uh, and they would join the staff and then they could actually, while being essentially assistant professor, associate professor, uh, work on a PhD while teaching. And, and, and I did that. And uh, you know, the funny thing was at the time that I joined, uh, I think the University of Bristol hired five of us out of industry with well, the same sort of level of experience uh, that was expected that we were brought towards the PhD. I was the only one that finished it, that did it, that actually did a PhD, which I did very quickly. Um, but anyway, I was the totally bogged down at Bristol, with no intention of, of, of leaving. And, uh, uh, and my wife uh, had a friend at the University of Toronto, and she was writing this lady at Christmas. And uh, she was in any message for Joyce, and I said, Oh, ask. And her husband was a young professor at Carlton, so I said flippantly, Oh, ask him if there any jobs at Carlton. <laughs> and next thing I had a phone call from the dean, there was on the airplane, and I had a job. <laughs> so I, it just happened, just like that. And uh, he, uh, I came back and he said, You've been associated with Carlton ever since. What have you taught at Carlton? Uh, I've taught basic thermodynamics and I've taught uh, the higher level propulsion courses and get advanced courses in gas turbines. And I, then I developed a course in professional practice for fourth year students, which covered a lot of things, so that's been very successful. Could you describe uh, a little bit about the, the aerospace program at Carlton? Yes. That, uh, one of the things that attracted me to Carlton was that they, they had uh, a strong uh, aeronautical background. And I said, it's easy to talk about aerospace. When I, when I graduated, there was no such thing that uh, the, the, uh, Sputnik came about three years after I graduated. And uh, uh, so there was aeronautical engineering, which was all aeroplanes. And, uh, uh, and Carlton had, uh, 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 the, the founding dean at Carlton uh, was a man from Alberta called John Ruptash, uh, who was an aeronautical engineer, graduate of the University of Toronto, uh, and he built up the, the department uh, at Carleton, or the faculty at Carleton in, in the early stages, uh, and because of his strong background in aeronautics, there were electives in fields like aeronautics and structures and things like, things like that. There were also masters and PhD programs uh, in aeronautics. Uh, many of which were closely associated with the National Research Council. Uh, the proximity of Carlton and NRC was very advantageous uh, to, 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 to both sides. Now, uh, when I came to, so I was attracted to Carlton because, uh, first of all, I thought it was in fact to come to, uh, that I thought, gee, you know, at Carlton, we've got NRC on my doorstep, uh, not that far from Pratt Whitney, and that the uh, 
uh, I should be able to sort of weasel my way in. But it's not easy to get into these places. Like it took me a long time to sort of weasel my way into into Rolls Royce, and particularly Derby, where the not invented here spring drone was quite high. Uh, but eventually, I sort of infiltrated myself into uh, these organisations quite successfully. Uh, so anyway, I was offered this job at uh, at Carlton, and they, uh, in fact, they wanted me to come as chairman of the department. And I said, I "Don't know if I can do that. You know, I've got no administrative experience, but uh, if you really want, I'll give it a go." You know, but fortunately, uh, a very eminent aerodynamicist, Bill Weinberg from NRC, who'd been working with Carlton as a session lecturer, uh, joined at the same time. He became chairman. Uh, and then four years later, I took over from 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 from, from him. But uh, that we had a very strong working relationship with both uh, Pratt and Whitney and uh, uh, the National Research Council, um, and also with the Orenda of the Institute. For the sake of this project, do you think you'd say uh, a few words about the some of the metallurgical research that was going on at uh, Carlton? Uh, well, there were essentially two very eminent uh, metallurgists, uh, Malcolm, uh, John Goldack and Malcolm Bibby, who, who were uh, together. But they, their main speciality was welding. And they, they in fact, uh, built a, a very uh, advanced electron beam welder at Carlton, which operated successfully for, uh, for, many, for many years. But they eventually, they closed that down and made it run for 20 years or so. Um, so there was, uh, there was, a, there were really only two, two metallurgists at, at Calm, but they were both first rate, uh, and they did a lot of collaborative work with atomic energy and, and people, people, uh, people like that. In fact, John Goldack uh, is still active uh, at Calm. He's a year younger than me, but he's still very active on the research side and has uh, major research grants. Uh, and I went the opposite way. I wanted to divest myself in research when I retired and still work with students in the teaching sense, but uh, I didn't want to be in research where I couldn't go away and leave my graduate students for long periods of time. Tell us what else was going on in the metallurgical research at Carlton, but the, uh, but the main thing that comes to mind certainly is, 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 is welding. That, that they were at the center of excellence in, in that. Could you describe uh, your work on uh, the uh, gas turbine theory textbook? Oh, yes. That, uh, when I was a student, um, uh, I came across a book in my final year uh, called Gas Turbine Theory by Conan Rogers, uh, which had just come out. Uh, and in fact, it was the only book I bought uh, in my academic career. And I was very interested in this, and I, I learned a lot, uh, a lot from it. Uh, and in fact, when I went to Arenda, I found that Conan Rogers was the Bible there. Uh, it's still referred to as the Bible of Rolls Royce to this day. Uh, and except now it's some of the Rogers and Cohen. Uh, and um, I, um, one of the big attractions of going to Bristol, uh, when I wanted to look for a university job, was at Bristol. The university uh, had also the Bristol Engine Company and then Bristol City on its doorstep. And I thought, if I go to Bristol University, surely I'd get myself into Bristol City. Uh, and the guy who was the head of the department was Rogers. So the, the combination of these things uh, was sufficient to lure me back to the UK. I had no wish to go back to the UK uh, at all. But the case was either I stay in industry uh, in Canada. Uh, or a job at British University. Now, in fact, if I had stayed at Orenda, uh, I'd have been laid off again uh, when your D4 went, when it bust uh, in 65. Uh, but anyway, I went to Bristol and then I, I, I worked on my PhD at, at Bristol, taught all the Yale courses there. Uh, and then just about the year before I left Bristol, uh, Rogers was approached by Longman, the publishers, uh, to ask if he and Cohen would rewrite a, a second edition of Gas Turbine Theory, which he was running for over 20, 23 years by this stage. Uh, so he 
ask me if I can, because I was working on things they had no idea about. But they, neither of them uh, had actually worked on gas turbines really after they wrote the book. They were both very brilliant guys, and uh, uh, Rods and Prichter was a uh, phenomenal teacher, but uh, they'd not been working in the field at all. I had been working in both industrial gas turbines, aero gas turbines, uh, at quite a high level on, on, on research projects. So Rod has asked me if I would help them to rewrite this. I said, oh yeah, I'd love to. So uh, I came in and added quite a lot to that, about the norms of the, uh, the modern stuff on double fans and multi spool matching and controls and stuff like, uh, stuff like, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, anyway, that, uh, so that came out and that was very successful. And uh, Cohen really didn't do much um, on, on that, he wasn't interested really. And then uh, he dropped out after that. And then Rogers and I redone, did a third edition uh, in about 1790, I suppose it was. Uh, and then uh, Rogers dropped out. And I did the fourth edition. Uh, I did that as a retirement project. Um, and I, okay, that's the uh, And then a little bit later, uh, 2001 marked the 50th anniversary of this book being written. So I really should sort of come up with a 50th anniversary edition. So I wrote the fifth edition by myself again. Uh, I did the fourth by myself, the fifth by myself. And then, okay, that's it, forget it. And then a bit later, I said, oh, well, it's not done yet. So the, the, the colleague Paul says, Nicky, who was working with me in these guest turbine courses I've been running uh, in industry. And uh, I said, would you be willing to write a, a design chapter to add in, into this, which was missing, uh, which Rogers had been very much opposed to because it was a, a new author. But uh, anyway, I persuaded Paul to come in. So we did the sixth edition, which is like, okay, then that's it. And when you believe, I mean, it's just started with a seventh. <laughs> uh, so it's actually been it's actually been running in continuous print for sixty-four years. Not bad. And it's been translated into uh, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Persian. But I know of. So you've continued to work with the aerospace industry while teaching at Carlton. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes. So I always, uh, when I was at, when I was at Bristol, uh, I spent more time at Rolls Royce than I spent at the, uh, at the university. Uh, that was on my doorstep, pretty well. Uh, but at, when I came back to Canada, uh, I immediately made contact with the National Research Council, uh, and there was. Uh, they had been very helpful in setting up the department at Carlton, Dr. Cockshut and Mr. Chapel. Uh, we Carlton owes them a great debt for what they did in setting up the religion and gas turbine lab at Carlton. But of course, I also had quite a lot of contacts at Pratt and Whitney that I'd worked with at Arenda. So I managed to uh, uh, make contact uh, with them. But when I got some, some grant money from NRC, uh, that I did a lot of joint projects with the, uh, uh, both the National Research Council and uh, Pratt, Pratt & Whitney. And I also got involved with NRC. Uh, I ran a committee for NRC, the, of an associate committee, it was a subcommittee of an associate committee of, uh, on propulsion, it was called the Industrial. The it was called, the, initially it was called the applications of industrial gas turbines, something like that. Uh, and NRC, eventually, when they cut back in a lot of areas, they cut off all these associate committees. But the subcommittee of the associate committee that I started is still running under the auspices of the Korean Gas Association. Uh, so this came out a lot of the, of the work I did on in, in industrial gas turbines. Also, uh, one of my, we had a very strong working relationship with the NRC and largely the thing was the advantage was that NRC had equipment and no bodies and we had bodies and no equipment. So we had, a, we had many years we had a lot of graduate students uh, at the doctor's, doctorate level or the master's level 
uh, working at uh, part time as students at Carlton working at NR NRC, uh, and the the end in lab at one stage that the the three top people in the engine lab were all my graduate students and then another of my graduate students uh, started his own company gas stops in 1979 and I've been associated with them uh, ever since and uh, we've, Carlton's got a strong relationship with them with lots of uh, students go there um, but certainly that uh, there had always been certainly in my time when I retired 17 years this very strong cross link between Carlton and NRC. And my colleague, uh, Professor Scholander, has continued this, and some of his uh, PhD students are now running some parts of the, the gas dynamics lab, or not the same as the engine lab. Is it? Uh, so, that, yes, we've got very strong relationships. But I've always been sort of a half an industry and half in academia. Could you tell us a bit more about the uh, the engine lab at uh, at the NRC and um, and their special equipment that you mentioned? Well, the engines. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we were able to do tests of J seventy fives and the PT sixes and things like this. That we, we have a small PT six in our own lab, but not just for undergraduate uh, teaching. But the, and they also have wind tunnel facilities here. We did quite a lot of the engine testing work here that we did massive thesis. Uh, on and that uh, uh, there was other work using sort of the big uh, turbine research rigs. There were several PhDs on, on those rigs from Colorado. Is this the Institute of Aerospace Research? It might be now. Okay. <laughs> these, 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 these names have all changed now. And uh, um, there used to be at NRC uh, high speed aerodynamics and low speed aerodynamics, the big wind tunnel. Out, out at the airport was low speed aerodynamics, you know, the high speed tunnels. Uh, maybe that was only two, I'm not sure. But Bill Rainbird, uh, who actually ran high speed aerodynamics, was the guy that came to Carlton uh, at the same time as I did. So he had a very strong link, uh, continued with NRC uh, aerodynamics, and that uh, uh, other people worked with NRC in combustion, and uh, others in metallurgy. So very strong, very strong link. I mentioned a kind of three way relationship between university research, uh, the government research, and industry. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Well, I'm totally out of date uh, on, on how that works now, but uh, certainly that there used to be uh, uh, the major source of funding for most university engineers uh, was the National Research Council, which eventually became NSERC. Uh, but also we got some money out of uh, industry. But this was more mainly uh, due to personal contact that people had. You know, it was not sort of some formal relationship between the university and Pratt and Whitney. Mm -hmm. There was a personal relationship between Professor X and Mr. Y and Pratt. We worked together and uh, uh, that, uh, that worked really, really well. What do you think the government's role should be in, in furthering aerospace research? That's a good question. That, uh, I think it's to support deserving projects. I think the projects have to come out of industry and say this is something that we we want to do uh, and uh, um, we, it's not a top priority, but something we really should do, uh, but we need some financial help to do that. That's probably the kind of thing where uh, it, 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 should, it should come in. But, uh, uh, now, if you look around the world, the aerospace things, uh, there's certainly every country uh, does support, government support for, it, for, for its industry. You know, there's lots of the economy says it's a waste of money and if the people put up the private money, it shouldn't be done. Well, that's rubbish. Uh, uh, because certainly that the look at France, the UK, Germany, Japan, the US, all of them are very heavily supported by, by, by the government. And the thing is that it's interesting to I gave a thing up the Guggenheim lecture uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where I sort of point out how if you go back to the um, 
the 50s. I, I, I gave this in 2002. And the, the lecture entitled 50 Years of Propulsion. And I actually traced the, the, the history of propulsion, civil propulsion, over these 50 years. And what was interesting was you found that at the beginning of this period, the dominant people in the aeroplane market, civil aeroplane market, uh, were Douglas and Lockheed. Boy, nobody had them. They were nowhere. The dominant people in the engine field were Wright and Pratt and Whitney. Wright disappeared. Pratt and Whitney came very close to disappearing, big Pratt. Uh, and the, who are the people now that are big in this field? Gen Electric, Airbus, Boeing. Now the point was that eventually people who didn't put money into research, keeping ahead of the game, were overtaken and disappeared. Or end of the case, case in point, when they, when they stopped really advancing, they, 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 they disappeared. And as they write, were a dominant force in, in, the, in the engine field, in the piston field, they really failed to make the move from a uh, piston engine to the, to, to the gas turbine. In Bristol, were very late in making the move from uh, gas from piston engines to gas turbines, and uh, so fundamentally, that the, the government support is is really important to uh, uh, to do these things that you can't immediately justify on a financial basis, and particularly now in North America, where everything is based on quarterly results, and that the uh, you might have some projects where it takes sort of 10 years to come to fruition. Well, no companies will look at that if, it's a, if, a, if, a, if the president is going to say, well, this, this year we didn't make any money and next year we didn't make any money. But in five years' time from now, we'll make a ton of money. We'll get nowhere. So they've uh, got to have some help from the government here and there. Now, for example, there's been a lot of criticism of the Pratt and Whitney have got quite a lot of support over the years. But you tell me any company in Canada that's had the international success of Pratt & Whitney, and I'll say there isn't one. That the, and if you, if you look, for example, at the car industry, which is the biggest exporter uh, in, in Canada, that you can see now it's falling apart because we're not doing anything that can't be done in Malaya or Korea or, uh, or wherever. That, uh, I mean, building cars now it's pretty Mickey Mouse stuff. But how many countries can actually build the whole, the whole range of things from aeroplanes to air engines to, to rockets to space and whatnot? And one of the very few that can do that is Canada. Uh, and Germany can't, and Japan can't, and the, the, the Japan are now trying to get back into the, the, the market with this Mitsubishi uh, regional jet, which is a long way behind schedule. Uh, and uh, Japan, for years, tried to get into the engine market, and they've been unable uh, to, 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 to do that. Now they do bits and pieces of other people's engines, like Kawasaki and IHI uh, do, do this, but uh, uh, in fact, Kawasaki were working with Rolls-Royce on marine gas turbines uh, way back at the time I wrote my book, in, in, in 1970, for but the Japanese have still not produced uh, military engines of any significance in, in themselves. How important is Bombardier in this equation? Bombardier is really quite important. The, the Bombardier, um, they're, they're, they're one of the big three uh, in the business jet market. And that was interesting the way Bombardier got into that because uh, Bombardier uh, had, uh, they were building, well, they started the jet, the wind jet program uh, by taking over the Learjet. Uh, and, uh, and then it was Dick Richmond, who was one of the great figures of uh, Canadian aerospace, and Dick Richmond at one stage ran Douglas, Pratt, Whitney, uh, uh, Spar. Um, and one of them, but you know, and he ran all these major companies, made a six, made a six of them. And he was one of the first guys in this idea of taking the Challenger business jet. And the, the thing that was different about the Challenger was it had a white body compared to the other business jet. 
And he came up with the concept of uh, stretching this uh, to sort of trade payload for range. Instead of having a 5,000 mile range with eight passengers, you get a 2,000 mile range with 50 passengers. Uh, and Canada Bombardier actually created the regional jet market. And nobody seems to realize, you know, that, okay, the Bombardier C series is, 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 is late, as with the A380, as with the 787, uh, um, and as is the MRJ21, the, the, the regional jet, as is the Comac 919, all late. Uh, and it's hard to think of a major aerospace program that has been on time. Mm -hmm. The engines have actually been pretty good, but the aeroplane is not so hot. Uh, but the fact is, it was, it was Bombardier that created this whole market. And the original Canada regional jet, uh, they sold something like 1,600 of those. So, and they were the third biggest, still are the third biggest manufacturer. They may have been taken over by Embraer now. And that, uh, but conceptually, the, the, uh, the CCA was, was a very clever idea. Look at this niche in the market. Unfortunately, what's happening now uh, is that the market seems to be moving up. The, you know, where the, 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 I'm sure the C series designed specifically to be nominally a 100 passenger airplane is the right size. And like the A380 319 uh, is basically too heavy when you make it, when you shrink it, you finish up with the big tail and the heavy undercarriage um, and, and stuff like that. Um, and so, in fact, that Airbus brought out the A320 Neo, the new engine family, and the A319 Neo was supposed to kill the C series. And then Boeing came out with the 737 Max. And actually, if you look at the sales of the A320 family, the start of you find now what has happened has been the sales have moved from the A319 to the A321. And now that the uh, the A320, the A319, and the smaller 737, which what the which what the CCA is supposed to compete again, uh, cover about two percent of the Airbus and Boeing sales, uh, and, at the, and the Airbus particularly, the A321, uh, is selling bigger and bigger numbers, um, and the whole market is moving up to bigger bigger aircraft. Now, if the C series gets into service. Uh, uh, and, and prove successful, it should sell well. Uh, and the, the, the question is, how is that market going to be filled? I mean, obviously Boeing and Airbus have moved out of it. The, the one that's actually filling that market uh, looked like more successful is Embraer in, 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 in Brazil. But there's, I, I mean, I get so annoyed when you talk about the, the, the fact that the Bombardier thing, the program, uh, the development cost is something like five billion dollars. I'm talking about now. Just the other day, I saw that uh, Fiat Chrysler uh, were going to develop a new minivan at a cost of two billion dollars. Well, come on, that, uh, two billion dollars for a minivan, and then people say that five billion dollars is a lot for a, an advanced aeroplane. So I think that uh, I certainly wish Bombardier well, mm -hmm. and that uh, uh, I think it's very much in Canada's interests that Bombardier uh, are supported and that uh, it's a case that everybody else is supporting their, their industry and that, uh, well, we, we actually, at the time that we did not support the industry and, and, and cut off the R or what have you, what did we lose? We lost an awful lot of good people. That uh, tremendous number of uh, the people that were that down from the Germany program and the Mercury program, people like Chamberlain and Lindley and what have you, uh, were, were top people. They were not appreciated in Canada, but they sure were appreciated in the United States. I know this is a big question, but um, how have uh, improvements in aerospace materials uh, take, taking place over your career, how has that affected your work on turbine engines? Um, it's not really affected my work, uh, because what I've really been doing a lot was uh, looking at operational problems of gas turbines, predicting performance and predicting deterioration and whatnot. So uh, really, that, it did not affect my, my work. It just it means that the, essentially engines are operating at 
ridiculously high temperatures to were when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when I joined, uh, started working in aero engines, uh, real hot truck temperature on a standard engine, military engines, but 1100 Kelvin. Uh, the other car was 1300 Kelvin. RB211 came into service at 1450 Kelvin. Uh, Trent's now up around 1850 plus, and the, the uh, and the, the, and of course you've still you've got much more cooling in these now, but still the, the if you're running at 1850 Kelvin, you're probably still running the the, the base metal at 1500 Kelvin. Mm. So there's been the, 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 the in fact the the increase in turbine temperature capability actually has mainly come not from materials. Uh, but from air cooling. So you find that, in fact, I think the number is roughly about 80% of the gain in turbine temperature over the years has come from cooling, and about 20% from materials. Can you think of any uh, significant Canadian contributes, uh, contributions to uh, aerospace materials? As again, I say I'm not the metallurgist uh, that uh, I think my answer to that had to be no, but I, but I don't. Um, well, most of the stuff on materials, you know, like people like Cannon Musket Gun and uh, International Nickel and mm -hmm. uh, Martin Marietta and people like that, and these are all American. And the, the, there was initially a lot of this work done in Britain, but I mean, not so much, not so much now, I don't, I don't know, but, but not really in Canada. I think we've actually been normally uh, a buyer of high performance materials. What do you think is your, uh, your most important contribution to uh, Canadian aerospace? I have absolutely no doubt just trained a number of really good engineers. Mm. Some of the people that I've trained for this up as the chief engineer of the Royal Air Force, uh, the director of Rolls-Royce, and very senior people at Pratt & Whitney, Honeywell, um, Solar. Um, but generally, I've got a lot of people I'm very proud of who've gone on to do things. Uh, and the Gas Tops, uh, again, is a company that started off one guy, Dr. McIsaac. Uh, I helped him from the beginning. I was appointed director. Uh, they've now built up to um, a staff of 100, 120 or so, uh, very high quality specialization now. I moved on from the work that we started with engine simulation controls uh, to oil debris monitoring and the world leaders uh, in this. So, my, as, as far as I'm concerned, my only useful product is people. Do you think? Uh Canada could over time have uh, sustained the fast chain industry? Yeah, I think we could. You know, not necessarily with, with the R, with all the technical capability of that, but it's basically a, a will. Do you want to do this or not? Uh, and everybody says Canada is too small to do those things. To which I had a cry, well, what about Sweden? Because Sweden is much smaller than we are, uh, but Sweden built fast aeroplanes for its own use. Uh, it started with the Draken, uh, which was only sold to the Swedish Air Force. Uh, it followed that with the Viggen, which was also only sold, sold, to the, sold to the Swedish Air Force. And these were built to meet particular Swedish requirements that nobody else had. The Viggen, for example, was, was designed to operate off highways uh, and unprepared uh, surfaces. The Viggen, the, 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 the Draken before it, the same. Uh, they eventually developed the Gripen. And the Gripen, uh, which uh, the, the Swedish Air Force started with themselves, uh, they've sold that to Czechoslovakia, to Hungary, to Thailand. Um, Brazil now. Brazil, yes. And uh, small numbers, but the point is that the Swedes said, this is what we want for our needs, and if we can sell it to somebody else, great. And if we can't, we're still going to do it. And uh, we could have certainly done, certainly done that. But we didn't. And it's, 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 it's interesting, I gave a lecture some years ago, after the hour of lecture, le, 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 lessons learned. And I, con I contrasted small companies, small countries uh, with small industries uh, that had been on, like Sweden and Holland, for a long time, Fokker did extremely well, but Fokker effectively weren't big enough. 
to survive uh, and, uh, and, and, and disappear. Uh, but Australia, Australia started off after the war, it's not the same as Canada. They were going to build aircraft from the license, the Sabre, and things like that. But Australia never got beyond doing that. They, they came up with some little Mickey Mouse thing called the Nomad, which had a lot of problems and never been sold at all. Uh, but uh, Canada actually developed the, the full spectrum of the uh, of aircraft and, and, and engines, and in particular niches. I mean, Pratt and Whitney Canada went after the small small market. Now, when you looked at turboprops, uh, at the um, when they first started the the sprawl of turboprops in the early eighties, suppose it was, there were five manufacturers. There was the uh, British Aerospace, there was Fokker, there was the Dornier, there was uh, Saab, uh, and Bombardier, and, that's, uh, and the ATR in, in, in Europe. Of these, about 80% were Pratt & Whitney Power. Uh, now the only type of props in production of the ATR family and Bombardier Q400, all of which powered by Pratt & Whitney. Um, so this is a case where, and then the, the Twin Otter, which de Havilland built, uh, was never really expected to sell that off. They made 885 of these, and now Viking Air out west is remarketing the new new build Twin Otters. It's off, gone, for, gone forever. So there's areas like that where we've got into this niche where we've done very well. But we could have done the same sort of thing with high speed. Yes, if we did the will to do it. What are some of the challenges that you face over your career? Probably getting old. I've been very lucky, I suppose. I got fired when I was quite young and I, I was early into the computer business and I was re-employable quite, quite quickly, so I was lucky. Yeah, I think the, the only thing I'd say in my career is that uh, I've actually, from time to time, made big decisions. You know, when you the easy thing is to say, no, I won't do that. Uh, I'm comfortable where I am. Uh, and I mean, when I decided to, to, to leave the UK and come to Canada, that was a very big decision. I didn't know a soul in Canada. I really didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, when I was settled in Canada, I got this unexpected opportunity to go back to Britain, which I didn't want, hadn't planned on doing. And every Iranian told me, you're crazy, that's stupid, totally wrong. So I did it. And that was one of the best moves I made. And then all came Carlton and brought me back. And again, it was a big move to sort of uproot from Bristol and say, I'm not settled here now, I can coast along for the rest of my days here. To come back again, so that every so often, you have to make these big decisions. And I think a lot of people fail to do that, and then they sort of sit in the same old job forever and they get fed up. Cynical, so on. So I've been very lucky, I've had a good career, and uh, I've always enjoyed what I was doing. That's the most important thing, is to do what you like. Because, uh, in fact, when I spent my six months in this computer consultancy, which was a very nice company, very good people, very nice people, I just didn't like work that much. And that, uh, so I was just delighted to get back into engineering a bit, and back into gas turbines. What's been the most difficult project that you've worked on? Mm. I don't really know. But, uh, I mean, I've always only been a sort of a bit player in these things, and I've been I've worked on uh, things. So I mean, I really can't answer that question because they've all been challenging. You know, the, the, I wouldn't say anyone is the most, the most difficult. But, uh, Have you ever worked for any particular di dysfunctional organizations? I think our radio has been dysfunctional. But, uh, uh, the top, I, I think that the whole Hawker Sidley operation uh, couldn't be much better run. And the, the, um, I say I was very low, 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 low down in the senior. Not at the stage, you can sort of really realize at that stage that all these big white, big 
big chiefs up there as well as the big the big feet there. What's your fondest memory that relates to your work? My fondest memory is standing on the runway at the first takeoff of the British, first British Tony Cup. I was very honored to be invited along as a VIP guest uh, to that because of the work I've done at the University of Bristol. It's quite a memory. It's mm. important. Mm. Or perhaps you could say actually I did manage to make one to one concord. And that was the other high point. Mm. How present or absent were uh, women in your profession, your workplace? Well, funny enough, when I went to work for this computer company, uh, the, I went to work for a lady. And that was a very smart play mathematician. And it was rather interesting because in those days, there was 59 I'm talking about. Uh, her name was Miss Milton. And uh, when I got to the company, I was quite surprised to find that they, uh, Miss Milton, who ran this little department, was about eight months pregnant. And the fact of the matter was, she wasn't Miss Milton at all, she was missing somebody, whatever, but she worked for IBM. And at IBM, you couldn't be married. And she, she, she had to leave. Now, my wife's sister uh, was a, a stewardess with Pan Am. And the, the Pan Am, in those days, the stewardesses had to retire at the age of 26, or when they got married, whichever came first. Now, there were very few engineers uh, in, uh, we had two women engineers in um, Orenda, uh, that uh, when I was a student, the, there was a, in the whole faculty of engineering at the University of Glasgow, there was one woman student in four years. Uh, but now at Carlton, we I got around about 15% uh, women. Uh, we've now got I think it's five women professors, so that they're, they're, they're certainly starting to appear more and more, uh, but uh, uh, they were not common uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in my career, but uh, they're becoming much more so. Now, what is quite interesting is that when I retired, uh, my, my son started a scholarship in, in my name. And one of the things that we wanted for this was not just Pointy heads of the highest average, uh, but people who were bright and who had contributed to society, be it outside the university or inside the university, uh, whatever. And this is a fairly major scholarship. Uh, and although there's only about 15% of the engineering body at Carlton are women, uh, the winners of this scholarship are probably at least 60% women. And a lot of them are uh, making major, major inroads into the uh, into the profession uh, now, but certainly the, it's been gradually rising. It's still not as high as it should be, and one of the problems is uh, so many girls, my wife is killed to say that, women shoot themselves in the foot by dropping physics. You know, the physics is hard, so they drop physics, and once you've got physics, they're out of a lot of things. So, the, but there's certainly uh, there's a ton of good women engineers um, out there, and certainly the, the, the women who were through engineering today do just as well as the men. Often better because they're high, more highly weighted. You have very few women who come into engineering and drop out. You have lots of men who come into engineering who can't hack it and drop out. Who would you say has been your greatest mentor or has had the greatest impact in your career? Three people. When I first went to Avenger, I was had a guy called Bob Sachs, who, who was a great guy. He was chief space engineer. Uh, he basically taught me all the virtues of working with the right people. You know, the, the, you, some, come, sometimes when young guys get into a company or even a university, they get into the wrong crowd. They get sort of the, the cynics and, ah, oh, they're all stupid here. They're, they're all, all a bunch of clowns over there. It's all geniuses and all here. It's nothing but idiots. Uh, and I recognized very early on, largely because of Bob Sachs' influence, to get into working with the keen people that were not sort of always whining and moaning. The next one was Dick Kwan, uh, who uh, was my direct boss for a long time. Uh, and he hired me back when uh, I came back to uh, Orlando. Uh, and he was influential in my getting the job at Carlton because. Uh, 
I know a number of people uh, who may be jealous of me uh, when I applied, was going to do this job at Carlton. They sort of said, yeah, he's no good. The, the, uh, and Dick Kwan happened to be the classmate of the guy who was head of the department. And um, he actually stood up for me over all these modern nails and uh, helped me get the job. And I always had the highest regard for, for him, and I'm still in touch with him. Uh, and it's quite funny because it did, one of the criticisms that made of me, very justifiable criticism by me saying, was that I kept a messy desk. And uh, I'm afraid I do. That, uh, 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 but anyway, that uh, some of these guys have said, oh yeah, he's never been to any he keeps with a messy desk. Well, eventually I won a major prize, the top prize from the SME Gas Turbine Institute, which had been won by people like Whittle and Von O'Hain before me. Uh, so I went to Dick Kwan and he said that I uh, just won the Tom Sawyer Award and the highest award from the, AD, from the ASME. And he sent me back a lovely memo, uh, email that said, son of Missy Kid makes good. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Gordon Rogers, uh, who uh, essentially uh, brought me into an academic career and he was my uh, inspiration from way back, long before I met him. Uh, and taught me an awful lot, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll see Dave now, but uh, those three guys. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? Well, first of all, do what you enjoy doing, collaborate with people, give credit where credit is due. Um, if you get it wrong, admit it. At one stage that uh, uh, I remember waking up in a panic because I had uh, done some stressing job and I said, oh my god, I did that in the base of the diameter instead of the radius. And, was, oh, and I rushed back in the following morning to tell Bob Sachs and screwed this up and actually I hadn't. I got it. Uh, but the point is that uh, you never, never hide something you've done wrong. If you've done, and uh, uh, from a young lecturer when I was first starting, when I was a student, uh, I learned a very important lesson uh, that the, very often the correct answer to a question is, I don't know. The better answer is, I don't know, but I'll find out by such a means. And when I was a young keen professor, I used to always say, I don't know, but I'll find out. But now that I'm an aged professor, I just say, I don't know, but I don't care. <laughs> what are you proud of, Simon? Ah, oh, I think I've raised a pretty good family. My my wife and three boys have all done very well, and that uh, uh, I'm certainly very proud of what they've achieved. And that uh, uh, I'm quite proud of the book, actually. That, uh, Is there anything else that you'd like to uh, add? I would like to. You, one of the original questions you asked me that you didn't come up with this was about my early early schooling. Right. Which is very important because I went to a school called Allen Glen School in Glasgow, and this was started by uh, a millwright in 1853 uh, who decided that there should be a school that offered good education to the sons of tradesmen who normally wouldn't go on, on to higher education. And he formed this school, which had an absolutely outstanding academic record. Uh, in a good day, I'd have maybe been fifth in my high school class. No, sorry, fourth. On a not a good day, fifth. But I remember a whole lot smarter than me. Out of my class in high school, uh, there were about 20 of us, no less than five got PhDs in science or engineering. Uh, another three became doctors, one became a dentist. And in fact, most of these guys were in fact the sons of tradesmen. That their parents had been shipyard workers, welders, what have you. They were the first generation to go to university. And this school turned out all sorts of people like that. Uh, and I was one of the few people that left high school uh, and went to university. I thought there was less competition at university than there was in school. Mm. One of the guys I referred to as one of the dropouts uh, eventually became captain of the QE2 and a senior vice president. Of Canard. Now, these were all guys that they had come from what we'd call, uh, what we called council estates, what I call projects, 
uh, here. And this was because of the um, foresightedness of this guy. And unfortunately, the city of Glasgow Council killed the school by sort of suddenly suggesting that it is not fair for a school to have a selective intake. It can only be based on geography. And it disappeared in, in, in no time. This is a high school that was also uh, amongst the graduates, Nobel Prize winner. And uh, it was actually a high school in the slums of Glasgow. Sounds like a very successful project. It certainly was. It is. Well, thank you for your time. Well, you're most welcome. I'm very glad to have talked to this. And I, I hope I've represented our end fairly reasonably. Uh, I'm actually one of the last ones left. The, the, all, the, all the good people uh, uh, are dead now. That, uh, there's a few like Dick Kwan still going strong, but all the key people, Bert Avery, Colin Rong, Jack Gordon, got, no, Jack Gordon, that's okay, um, uh, are all, all gone. But they were in the 90s or late 80s. Yes, yeah. important Canadian story. Okay. Mm -hmm.